Welcome, friends. This is Economic Update, a weekly program of analysis of economic events that are important in our lives, shape our futures, as well as our presents. My name is Richard Wolf. I've been the host of this program for a little bit over two years. I've been a professor of economics all my life at a number of different universities. Currently, I teach at the Graduate Program for International Affairs of the New School University uh, in New York City. I want to remind everyone that this is a program based on documents issued by the government, by researchers, economists, and others. I try, where possible, to explain where the numbers and statistics come from, but you can al always follow up on what I do uh, by checking the two websites that continue the research on an ongoing basis that appear on this program. The first of the two is called rdwolf with two Fs dot com. That's where literally all the research I do, the talks I give, the interviews I give, uh, are carried and available for your access 24 hours a day at no charge. The other website we maintain is called democracyatwork.info and that's where you'll see also the kinds of work where we focus on the solutions to the economic problems we identify and analyze in the program. So please make yourselves at home in these two websites it is a way to follow and enrich whatever understandings I'm able to contribute to in this program. Finally, let me uh, welcome and continue to invite your comments, your questions. You can send them to me through either of those two websites, and I'll give you the address again later in the program of the websites. But uh, we use all your questions and comments not only to shape our programs in general, but we select a few. We apologize we could not possibly answer all of them but we select a few and respond to them usually in the last 10 or 12 minutes of each hourly program to literally engage with your thinking and with your responses uh, to this program so let's get right to it you'll have me today on my own presenting the economic analysis and next week we'll have a very interesting guest for you, Laura Flanders, some of you know, and she'll be talking about some of the work she's been doing, particularly looking at some remarkable new kinds of enterprises being set up, such as the New Era Window Company in Chicago that converted from a capitalist enterprise into a workers' co-op. It's a wonderful story, and that will be one of those we explore with Laura Flanders next week. So let's turn to the economic updates that we're ready to do here in the middle of May 2013. I want to begin with a story out of England about an American company. The company you all know, it's called Google. And they got themselves into a whole peck of trouble in Great Britain. And Great Britain's government is going after them. Let me explain. The head for all of Northern Europe, for Google, is a man named Matt Britton, a Briton as it happens. And he has been called back to testify, it's not his first time, in front of the British Parliament's Public Accounts Committee, the PAC. And they're angry. Let me give you an idea of what some of the members of Parliament, elected members of Parliament in England, had to say to Mr. Britton. Uh, along the following lines. First, and I'll mention that this is Stephen Barclay, a member of the ruling Conservative Party. It really doesn't wash what you are telling us. Wow. That's a polite way of saying you're lying. Chairman of the, chairwoman of the committee, Margaret Hodge, also an elected member of Parliament, said... You do evil. Wow. What is it they're so angry about with the Google Corporation? And the answer is something that is important not only for Google and not only for Great Britain, but important to everyone in the world to understand. Corporations that are large, we call them multinational corporations because they're active in a number of countries. And one of the reasons they're active in a number of countries 
is because countries differ in the tax rates they apply to corporate profits. If you do business in one country, you have to pay a relatively higher tax rate on your profits. Whereas, if those profits had occurred in another country, you might get away with paying a lot less. Wow! This leads corporations to do something called transfer pricing. It's a simple idea. You make your profits appear in the country that tax use, taxes you the least. This isn't complicated. Let me give you an example. And in fact, I'll give you the example of Google. And I'll give you the example of what Google did in Britain, according to the British Parliament. And the British Parliament is hopping angry. Between the years 2006 and 2011, according to Parliament, and based on Google's own filings, Google generated $18 billion in revenues from business it did in the United Kingdom, in Britain. Its total tax payments to Britain for that period was $18 million. Now, I did the arithmetic. This works out from 2006 to 2011, to an effective tax rate in Britain for Google of less than one-tenth of one percent. Let me do that again. Not the 25, 35, 40 percent that corporations in Britain are supposed to pay on their profits. Nothing like the 35 percent Google would have to pay on its profits in the United States, because that's the rate here. No, no, in Britain, Google got away with paying one, less than one-tenth of one percent on the 18 billion in profits it generated from activities in Britain. How did it do that? Transfer pricing. Here's how that works. You set the price of something in Britain low, because you don't want to make profit. You get a low price of what we're doing here. We're not, we're not making any money. And then you sell that good that is priced lowly in Britain by Google. You sell it to another Google subsidiary. Let's say, and this is the example in England, in Ireland, which has a very low tax rate on corporations. You sell it at a low price to your subsidiary in, in Ireland, and they then jack up the price to where it ought to be having bought it cheaply from their subsidiary in England and selling it at the high price that is the normal market price, all the profit shows up in Ireland, paying a low tax. And none of it, or nearly none of it, shows up in England. Wow. You do the business in England, you finagle the prices so it shows up in Ireland, and you get out of paying England anything. And the English, the British, the Parliament is furious. Why do I tell you this? Because all major corporations are tempted to do this. And very few of them resist the temptation. End result? Countries needing tax revenue from their corporations are denied it. Corporations make even more money than they were making before because this is a way of evading taxes. They move the prices around, buying and selling from, from themselves, moving objects from one company to another, just on paper. They don't actually have to move, so that the profit shows up in the country where the tax rate is the lowest. It's a standard operating procedure, and it is driving the people in England, the conservative government, Angry, angry, angry. Question, why is there no equivalent investigation? Why are there no equivalent public hearings excoriating the same companies in the United States, including our own Google, for doing the same and depriving the United States of desperately needed tax revenue? Might that not be a better way to deal with our economic problems than cutting payments to Social Security recipients over 65 after they've given a lifetime of work. 
seems to be a logical question, wouldn't you say? Next update has to do with the SNAP program, S-N-A-P. It's what we used to call food stamps. It's administered by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, here's the statistic I want to drive home. Currently, latest data released this last week by the Department of Agriculture shows that 19.57% of the American population is on food stamps. That's right. One out of five of our fellow citizens earns so little money that the government not, must, by its own rules, which are strict, help them pay for basic food items so that they do not go hungry. One out of five. Not only is this an unbelievable statement about where we have come to as a society, but I want to stress that since 2009, as unemployment in the United States has very slowly gotten better, that is, we've seen a fall in unemployment so that we're now only at 7.5%, which is horrible, which tells you that 10 to 15 million Americans are out of work and looking. But over the time that unemployment has gotten a bit better, the dependence on food stamps has gotten much worse. So the line goes down for unemployment, but it keeps going up for food stamps. Why? Because the people who are getting jobs, who used to be unemployed, are getting jobs whose pay is so low that they continue to require food stamps to supplement a level of wages that does not allow them to minimally feed their families. So much for the so-called recovery. Once again, as I have stressed, the recovery of the economy in the United States is like the famous story of Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities. We might call here in the United States a tale of two recoveries. One covers five or ten percent of the people. Those are the ones sitting on top of corporations who are paying themselves again the multi-million dollar salaries. Among them also are the people who own large blocks of shares. The boost in the stock market has really helped them. Those are the folks at the top. They're the ones who did the best over the last 30 years. They're the ones whose speculations helped bring the crash. They're the ones who got the lion's share of the bailouts during the crash. And now they're the ones who are the first and only part of our economy to recover. Suggests something, doesn't it? For the mass of the American people, no recovery at all. Most of them still have no jobs. And those who get jobs get them at such bad conditions that our food stamp dependence keeps rising. The median income of Americans dropped like a stone in 2009 and 10. From roughly 56,000, median means half the American people did better, half did worse. From 56,000 to 51,000. And it has stayed at that low level right to the present. No upturn, no recovery. That's two people working, 50 grand, family of four average. Think about it. We're not recovering for the mass of people. And it says something about our society that is profound. The third and final update today has to do with education. I ought to spend a lot more time on this topic, but there are so many demanding attention, I can only do so much. I wanted to talk about several phenomena in our public education system, and in particular our what we call public higher education. That means colleges and universities. First, the basic facts. We have, depending on whether you just count full-time students or part-time students, we have something on the order of 16, 17 million Americans going to colleges and universities. Three quarters of them go to public colleges and universities. So let me first make it really clear. If you believe in higher education, in the value, the importance of a college education, a university education, 
then what you have to thank in the United States is the government. Because the government has been and is now providing the overwhelming bulk of the education Americans get at the college and university level. And that's been true ever since the end of the Second World War, when the demand of the American working people, whether you call them the working class or the middle class, the same people, when they demanded finally to be able to get a college and university education for their children. That suddenly plunged us into a crisis. You know why? Because until then, education was private, private schools, and there weren't very many of them, and they catered only to the richest Americans. So that when the mass of Americans coming back from World War II said, we want an education for our children, there were no places. And not only that, the families couldn't afford it. That's why we had a GI Bill giving returning soldiers money to pick, go to school. They couldn't have afforded it otherwise. But there weren't, there weren't places. Solution, the governments of all 50 states built a public higher education system, public universities, public colleges, community colleges, state universities, all of it, to create the places and the low prices to allow the average American to begin to think about sending his or her kids to school. What a wonderful idea, what an expansive demand, and we were strong enough as people to give ourselves and our country that, and our economic well-being afterwards has been in debt to that ever since. Well, everything has changed since the 1970s, and that change has been accelerated during the crisis of the last seven or eight years, let me give you some idea. Back in the 1980s, here was how public, high uh, public universities and colleges were paid for. 80% of the cost of educating a young man or woman in a public higher education institution, college or university, 80% was paid by the government. 20% was paid by the student and his or her family. 80-20 split. Wow. That's why it was affordable to middle and working class Americans. That's why they got a chance. What is it today? 80-20? Not even close. Today, it's 50-50. The states have cut back their support for public higher education. Steadily between the 1980s and 2007 and more quickly during the current crisis. So that now an individual and his or her family have to pay half the cost. And the cost has gone up across this period. No wonder students are finding themselves in ever deeper debt. No wonder their families are incurring ever deeper debt to get their kids through the schools. During that, those years, we cut taxes on corporations and we cut taxes on the wealthy. So they did better while working and middle class families had to pay more and more and more of the cost of a college education. It's awful. Recently, more information has come to light. Two bits. One, that more and more colleges and universities, private and public, are giving money, the scarce scholarship money they have, to people who don't need it. That is, it's not any longer need-based scholarship. It's merit-based scholarship. Why? Because the colleges and universities facing a public that can't afford to go to school are beginning to compete with one another, and they compete by trying to get the highest scores possible. So they want to give scholarships to young people who have high scores. Guess what? Those come out of the better income neighborhoods, the better high schools, at the private schools that work on getting your grades up, all the rest of it. So what we're seeing is less money available just as working and middle class people need it more because the competition of the colleges faced with the collapse of public higher education. You see the picture? It's the abandonment of a fundamental right of young people to have the education their capabilities allow them to develop so that we all get the benefit of the productivity and the creativity they have in the rest of their lives. It is a tragedy of what's happening, and it can continue only 
if the mass of people directly being hurt in the present by what's happening now and in the future as we discover more and more young people can't afford it, will not go, are making choices not about what they love and will be good at, but what will pay the bills they're accumulating and that they don't want to impose on their families. What a thing for the so-called richest country in the world to be doing to its own children. Let me turn now to the more substantive things that I like to talk about after the shorter items that we comment on and analyze. I want to talk today about a perennial topic, but that has some news in the world these last few weeks and months that need us uh, to talk about it. I'm talking about medicine, the medical establishment, or what really ought to be called the medical industrial complex. Uh, And I use that term advisedly because it really has to do with uh, a complex, like the industrial military complex. Who are the players in the medical industrial complex of the United States? Four industries are crucial. The drug industry, and I include there the people who make devices as well as medicines that we take. Number two, the doctors. Number three, the hospitals. And number four, the medical insurance companies. Drug companies, doctors, hospitals, insurance. Four big industries that control and work closely together the medical economy, you might say, of the United States. And I want to bring to your attention the work of a former colleague of mine, Professor Gerald Friedman of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, who does really stunning research on the medical industry. And I am relying on his kind work, just as, for example, in my reporting about Google, I relied on the British news service Reuters, which has been covering the hearings in the British Parliament uh, very effectively. So what does Mr. Friedman teaches us? Well, let's get into it this way. In 1971, Canada, our neighbor to the north, spent more money as a share of its wealth on medical business of one kind or another than the United States. And I picked 1971 because in 1971, Canada changed its medical system. It established a national medical system. It's called the Single Payer Program Basically, the citizens of Canada pay into a fund. The fund takes care of much of the insurance and the medical care. It is a system like exists more or less in all other advanced industrial countries except the United States. And it accounts for the following facts about them all and then the fact that is most interesting about Canada. First, the fact about them all. The United States spends twice as much money on its medical system as a share of its total wealth as any other country in the industrial developed world. Twice as much. We are out of pocket as a people twice as much as our citizens in other countries industrialized and wealthy like us. Well, let's ask the obvious question. Do we get twice as good medical outcomes? Not at all. Our medical outcomes, longevity, number of kids that die in the first year of their thing, hospital stays, length of illnesses, all the measures the medical profession uses to measure the quality of the medical results we get from the money we pay shows the United States middle, mediocre, far from the best. Okay, let's put it together. We pay twice as much as anybody else but we don't get anything like twice as much as a result. If the so-called market worked, we would have changed this situation long ago. Nobody wants to pay twice as much for something that isn't as good as something that costs half the price. But we have a medical industrial complex that makes sure we have no alternative. Now let's go to Canada. Canada was like that before 1971. Then they switched to what Americans 
are taught to fear as socialized medicine. And guess what? Here we are, 40 years after the change in, in, uh, in results, and what is it? Canada has controlled its costs. Here's what the numbers say. In the United States, we now spend, per person, over $3,000 more for our medical care on average than the Canadians do. For a family of four, that's $12,000 per year. That's what it costs in the United States to get the medical care that doesn't give us any better results than the Canadians have. Why? Because they broke down the private enterprise capitalist system that governs medicine here in the United States. The insurance companies are private enterprises trying to maximize profit. The drug companies are private capitalist enterprises trying to maximize profit. The hospitals are private enterprises trying to maximize profit, and they do that even when they call themselves tax-exempt or not-for-profit. Just look at their books. And the doctors are trying in their group practices to make as much money, call it profits, call it income, as they can. Profit-driven, price-driven, income-driven private enterprises. Here are the results according to pre uh, Professor Friedman. In the average physician in the United States now spends four times as much money interacting with insurance companies as does the average physician in Ontario, Canada. For example, in the United States, per physician, $80,000 is paid to deal with the insurance companies. 20000 in Ontario, a four-to-one ratio. Now, let me explain, friends. If the physician who treats you has to spend a fortune on clerks and equipment and records and all of the rest of it to haggle with a dozens of insurance companies who are honoring or not honoring your claim for coverage to help you get out of an illness or an injury, he's going to pass on the costs in the fees he charges you and the fees that are paid by your insurance company are going to be higher. And they, in turn, are going to charge more for your employer to cover you or for you to pay. You get the picture? American medical enterprises are wasting huge amounts of money and jacking up their prices along the way. Again, Professor Friedman's numbers. Between 1980 and 2005, administrative costs, that's all the people having to manage, excuse me, this private capitalist system, rose by 1,300%. And from 1980 to 2005, drug prices rose by 2,000%. That's why our medical costs are out of control. It has nothing to do with people using doctors too often. The horrific claim of those who don't want to face what it is we have as a problem, which is a health system that could and should be run outside of the maximized profit motive. That's what's been decided in all the other countries more or less completely. Only in this one is everything left to the market and the profit motive, with the result that we are paying way too much and it is crippling our economy. Here are some other medical uh, items for you to contend with. A recent set of editorials in the New York Times and elsewhere covered the work and announced the work of two interesting researchers, David Stuckler and Sanjay Basu, B-A-S-U. They are researchers whose book, I will title it to you, uh, The Body Economic, Why Austerity Kills. Their research shows that in those countries, which include the United States, where the current crisis since 2007 has led the government to cut back on its programs, 
that in those cases where the cutbacks included medical things of all kinds, the results for the health of our citizens has been catastrophic. The big headline grabber was the extraordinary increase in suicides. 5,000 more suicides a year since the crisis of 2008 here in the United States alone. The sequester that went into effect in the United States on March 1st is scheduled to cut supports for pregnant women in their nutrition programs, cut back on even the budget of the National Center for Disease Control in the South that helps us deal with epidemics. This is craziness. This is making sure that corporations and the rich don't have to pay the taxes that they used to. We've documented that on this program many times. To save them on taxes, we are literally killing people in our own society and elsewhere. It is an amazing thing. To give you yet another example, and I apologize for the the sheer grossness of what I'm about to tell you, my attention was caught by something happening in two countries that have experienced the most extreme form of crisis of the last few years and cutbacks. I'm speaking of Cyprus, a little island nation in the middle of the Mediterranean, and Spain, the fourth biggest economy in Europe. The same thing has been happening in both of those societies. And I want to tell you about it. And you can find out more at qz.com, at the internet where this story was first promoted. Women in growing numbers, particularly in Cyprus, but also in Spain, are selling their eggs to get by. That's right. The eggs that, if fertilized, become human beings are being purchased by those doing well in the economic crisis and therefore able to pay the thousands of dollars, enabling poor women with no other option because of an economic capitalist system that doesn't work, have been forced now to sell their eggs. And in case you're wondering, yes, it's a dangerous procedure. It can have serious medical consequences. But even if you put that aside, what does it tell you about the level to which economic dysfunction is now part of our society? The medical story is always a clue to how a society is working. It's like how we teach our children, how we treat our elderly, and how we take care of the accidents and injuries and illnesses that come and afflict rich and poor, white and black, young and old. Do we have a sense of community to care for one another, or have we lost it and become so determined to go after the wealth, and the richer we are, the more we can do it, and let the elderly and the children and the schooling and the medical care fall by the wayside. What kind of a society are we? What are we allowing to happen and to take place? As if to drive this point home yet another way, I need to return to another topic that demands our attention. And in this topic, what I'm concerned with is an enormous issue, global economic development. But I want to start with something I have talked with you about, and that is the collapse of that building in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Happened on the 24th of April, 2013. I've been telling you about how the death toll has risen. We seem now to have, here in mid-May, almost a month later, a final number. Staggering. 1,127 dead working people. Most of them working in the garment factories 
that occupied most of the building that collapsed. We have also learned in the sheer embarrassment of the companies who were forcing these workers to work under these conditions, threatening them with, excuse me, with job loss if they didn't accept the wages, the horrible working conditions, the risk to their lives, and as we now know, the loss of those lives. And what were the numbers? Well, they're coming out now as the embarrassed companies try to use advertising to suggest their concern with safety conditions. Now that it's obvious they had no such concern. And we see also the embarrassment of the government officials. We're going to do something, really. As if you didn't know that the city and the surroundings of Dhaka were, were and are full of unsafe buildings, full of horrific working conditions. And what are those conditions? Well, the government is beginning to release the statistics. The low wage, the minimum wage paid by many of these garment industries to their workers. You ready? $38 per month U.S. In U.S. currency, $38 a month. Keep remembering that. It's an important statistic. Other fact. No unions were allowed. This was the law until mid-May in Bangladesh. You could not organize a union at a workplace unless and until, get this, you had the written permission of the employer. That's right. You as a worker could not organize a union to bargain with your employer unless and until the employer gave you the permission. And guess what? Few employers did give the permission. Wow. No union, $38 a month, desperate workers. There's the recipe. What does this teach us about economic development? A couple of lessons that I want to drive home. First, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan all had clothing industries for most of their histories. Clothing is a big item. Everybody wears it. So we need to buy lots of it for our growing population to replace items of clothing when they wear out, even to buy special outfits for special occasions. Clothing is big business. And over the years, as clothing workers struggled for a decent wage and decent working conditions in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan, and formed unions in those places, we had a growing rise in the wages and improvement in the working conditions for the millions of workers in the clothing industries of the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. Over time, therefore, we had the following bizarre reflection on a capitalist economy. The more successful over time workers were in getting higher wages, the more incentive their employers had to substitute cheap workers for what the workers were costing them back in the U.S., the Europe, and Japan. And the capitalists eventually reacted because from the capitalist perspective, the real deal that you offer your worker is accept low wages or else you'll get no wages. And what the clothing capitalists in Europe Japan and the United States eventually did, particularly starting in the 1960s and 70s, was to leave the United States and leave Europe and leave Japan and move to places, why? To places elsewhere, why? To places like Bangladesh, 
Why? Because it's $38 a month, whereas in the United States, it was reaching 5 to $10 an hour, maybe even more. Wow. And so capitalist countries discovered the fundamental disloyalty of capitalist enterprises. We go, say the capitalist enterprises, because competition compels it. We go to where the money is, where the profits are, and that means where the wages are low, where the rules governing how we can treat our workers are poor, where the unions are absent because they're not permitted, and where we can get away with, yeah, murder. And they went to Bangladesh, just like they went to China, or Vietnam, or Paraguay, or dozens of other low-wage countries. And they went there for a reason, to make more money. And they abandoned the clothing factories back home in Europe, in Japan, in the United States. And they decimated the communities that depended on clothing jobs for their citizens. Did they take care of those communities? No, they abandoned them. And those communities have been in trouble. Just visit any of the old clothing centers in New England, in the South, abandoned by the producers who had to go to places where you can pay $38 a month. Wow. And what were the consequences? Well, again, I don't have the time, but I'm going to pick two. One of the consequences of the profit-driven capitalist abandonment of the places in the world where capitalism began, to move to the more profitable places, China, India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Paraguay, Nigeria, you name it. One of the consequences is ecological damage for my environmentalist listeners. Because you know, it's one thing to produce clothing here in the United States and ship it to our people here who are going to wear it. It's a completely different thing to produce it halfway around the world in Bangladesh. Because then once you've made the t-shirt or the socks or the underwear, you have to ship it on a freighter across the ocean. You have to use wild amounts of energy for that trip to be made. You pollute that ocean as you move. You pollute the air as you move. You waste precious resources as you move. And the only reason the clothing companies do it is they save so much on the low wages they pay that they don't care about paying for the freight to bring it back. The environment may be damaged, but who cares? The profit is the bottom line that makes it happen. The second effect is in the end, if anything, even more profound. In the United States and Western Europe, here's what's happening. The good, well-paying jobs that once existed in the clothing industry and that once existed in so many other industries, are being destroyed as those jobs are being moved by the capitalist employers, leaving behind unemployed people, scurrying to get a job flipping hamburgers or making cappuccino or whatever job they can get. The incomes of working people, the so-called middle class, being decimated. That's why so many are on food stamps. That's why the recovery is as I described it earlier this hour. The gap between rich and poor getting terribly widened in Europe, in, in the United States, and Japan. But here's the irony. The same growing inequality of income and wealth is happening in the countries to which the capitalists are going. The gap between rich and poor in China, India, and Bangladesh is enormous. Most of the money being made there is going to the people at the top. Obviously, it's not going to people who earn $38 a month. It's going to their employers. In other words, as capitalism evolves in the new 21st century, 
it is producing at both ends of the spectrum. In the old developed world, United States, Europe, Japan, and in the newly developing world, China, India, Bangladesh. Unbelievable extremes of wealth at one end and mass economic deprivation, difficulty at the other. In this way, in this polarization, illustrated by what has gone on in Bangladesh, by literally the denial of unions, the payment of unbelievably low wages, and finally the profit-driven poor construction, poor maintenance, and terrible safety controls that killed 1,127 of Bangladesh's citizens. We are producing a polarized society, and I don't think that is a future anyone wants, and I don't think it's a future that will be sustainable. The social tensions being built up by this kind of capitalist development should long ago have made us aware that we ought to be asking and answering the question, can't we do better than capitalism and the development it is imposing on us? As I do toward the latter portion of every program, I want now to turn to a couple of questions and respond to them that you have uh, sent in. The first one, and quite a few have picked up on this, had to do with a brief discussion I offered about anarchism. Uh, the growing movement, and I believe it is growing, at least for a while, here in the United States, but also in other countries, of, again, particularly young people, who are raising fundamental questions about how we organize modern society. And given what I've just finished saying, we can certainly understand and sympathize with the questions they're raising. They're good questions, they're profound questions, they're long overdue, and people in earlier generations were smart enough to ask them, and I'm glad to see people are wising up to ask them again. What is the anarchist question? The question is this, do we really benefit from, do we really need in modern society such a powerful ent entity as the government, an entity that monopolizes means of force, weaponry that are staggering, that nobody else in the society can uh, acquire or use, uh, an entity that has enormous powers of taxing us to assemble the resources to kind of overwhelm us with the controls it can operate, with the activities it can start and maintain, with the limits to our own freedom that it can impose, and so on. Good question. But there are kind of two ways to go with anarchism, and anarchism comes in a variety of types that are quite different from one another. So that for most conversations, it really won't do to say something about anarchism or anarchists as if they were all the same, because they aren't. So let me give two examples. Some anarchists are determined to question powerful central states and to ask and answer the question, can't we better govern ourselves? Can't mechanisms of government come from below? begin with the individuals getting together to govern themselves and not creating a, a powerful apparatus that then develops a bureaucracy that then becomes no longer what we set up to govern ourselves, but becomes something separate from us that lords it over us. Profound questions, good questions. And typically that kind of an anarchist wants to ask that question not only about civil society, where we live, the residents, the politics, but also wants to ask it about economics. Can't we as working people run our own enterprises, just as as citizens we run our own government? And if so, wouldn't that be more democratic? Democratic in the political sense that we run our own government, we really do, keeping it local, keeping it decentralized, 
keeping it very accountable and accessible to individuals? Well, then the argument goes, why not at the enterprise? Make it democratic too. The decisions about what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits can and should be made from below by the workers who make all those things and by the communities they live in, not by some board of directors that isn't even elected, let alone controlled by the workers, but is in fact chosen by the major shareholders who don't work there either. These are questions where anarchists and those who want to change beyond a capitalist economic system have a lot to talk about and share a lot. But there's other kinds of anarchists where there isn't so much sharing. And I want to be clear about that kind, too. And one of the people who wrote into me said, why don't you call that primitive anarchism? Well, I don't want to attach labels, but let's go with it for a moment. In this view, it isn't that government from below, real democracy from below, is being advocated. No, it's rather a different kind of, let's call it analysis, let's call it maybe even diagnosis, that the problems of our society come, begin, and end with the government, that we shouldn't worry about business and corporations and the economy, that that's not our problem. That's okay. It's the government that makes everything bad happen. There's where I part company, just for those of you that might be interested. I think that's a mistake. I think that it, if you had to choose between who's calling the shots, between government and corporations, I understand they both have their roles to play. I understand they both shape each other. But if you push me, it's the corporations that in the end call the tune. It's in the end they who are running these societies. But in any case, you have to go to the government and the business leadership to see where the problems come from and where the solutions lie. To the degree that anarchists open that space and go in that direction, more power to them, even if that's not the quite phrase they would like me to use. Where they blame the government for everything, no, I don't think that washes. But like with all these discussions, my job is to stimulate and to open, not to close anything. Finally, in my few minutes that remain to us, I wanted to answer a theoretical question, a question that came to me uh, as an economics professor, and I suspect from a, at least a couple of these questions, uh, other professors were asking the question, perhaps even tongue-in-cheek, but they're good questions. It goes like this. For all production to occur in any economy, you need three things, so the question goes. Land, labor, and capital. You need the land because it provides the raw materials, the food, and is the, literally the soil on which any production has to happen. You need the capital, tools, equipment, and raw, machine, and raw materials, because that's how a worker works. And you obviously need the labor because it's the labor that puts everything together to produce the final output, goods and services alike. And so the question goes, if you need land, labor, and capital, isn't it reasonable, isn't it appropriate, isn't it logical that you have to pay the landholder to make available the land, the capital owner to make, away the, to, to make available the capital, and the laborer to provide the work. And there my answer is a resounding no. And let me explain. Land, let's start with that, because we discussed it last week, and I suspect these questions came in out of that discussion. Land isn't produced by people. 99.9% .9 of the land on this planet wasn't produced by any people. There's indeed a, quite a debate about where the land comes from but nobody argues it was produced by the people. So we're not paying for land in the sense we pay for a shirt. There we know we're paying for something people had to produce to get it to be in existence, not the land. Or to say the same thing as bluntly as I know how, the land is there for us whether or not we pay the landlord. What's the point here? Somehow we allowed as a human civilization, for something not created by individuals to become the private property of individuals. 
the land. And if you allow land to be the private property of somebody, all that that means, all that the words private property ever meant, was the right of the owner to withhold what he or she owns from the community. That's all private property means. And we ought to wonder, as by the way, all the great religions of the world have wondered through their history, whether this isn't a kind of disrespect to a deity, to a spirit, to God, whatever you want to call it. Since people didn't create the land, where do they get the sense that they have the right to own it. And if we don't give people private property, guess what? Then the land would be considered the right of everybody, the gift of the spirits of the gods to all of us, a a resource for all of us. We wouldn't then allow it to be anybody's private property, something anybody could withhold, because that would be blasphemy. That would be inappropriate. We might then deal with the land the way the Native Americans did, as a treasure, as a gift, as something to be rewarded, to be cared for, to be lived in harmony with. But there'd be no rent to pay because there'd be no owner who could demand a rent because otherwise he wouldn't make it available. That would be out of order and illegal. And then there'd be no question of paying rent. Well, we're going to continue with this next week because there I'm going to suggest something that I want to tease you with now. That just like we don't need a landlord or rent to have the land available, we don't need to pay profit to a capitalist to still be able to have tools, equipment, and raw materials. Those were made by workers, not by capitalists. And we're going to pick up on that when we meet again next week. This is Richard Wolff thanking you for joining me for Economic Update, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week. <laughs>